nitrogen initiative and currently directs the UNEP, JEF, UN International Nitrogen Management System, and the UPRI Global Challenge Research Funds, South Asian Nitrogen Hub. Professor Sutton is also co-chair of the UNEP Task Force on Reactive Nitrogen and vice chair of the Global Partnership on Nutrient Management. I would like to welcome Mark Sutton for his keynote. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Rifath, and thank you, Zamila and colleagues uh, for the work together on the South Asia Nitrogen Hub. Uh, I first came to Maldives in 2017, and I think this is now my fifth time. So uh, 50 years with no visits, and then nearly five times in the last five years or so. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, the research to catalyze policy change, which is, of course, uh, the theme of the conference. And I'm going to do it by talking about my area. Uh, and so I, I start with this point about air quality barriers. Um, why is it that nothing happens? Why is it even when you know what you should do that nothing happens? And I, I, this is a personal experiment, and I'm not sure uh, I'm through the personal experiment yet. Uh, but the hypothesis being that a stronger, bigger approach that looks to circularity, looks to wealth generation, may help us through there with multiple benefits. Uh, these are the various bodies we're working with, which REFAF has already introduced. Um, so let's take this as a sort of personal journey and go back 20 years. What was the kind of science uh, we were doing? Uh, it was very much process-based. We were still in we're already interested in integration, um, but very much on the science end. So here's a picture of our experiment. Uh, 50 scientists descend on one field to measure everything. Measure everything you can possibly imagine about ammonia, one form of nitrogen pollution. It's a form of nitrogen air pollution, NH3 nitrogen and three hydrogens. Uh, so 50 scientists in the field measuring every dimension. We produced 17 peer review papers. It took us nine years to get those papers out. Um, and uh, I think the joke is that uh, any policymaker wants their results a lot sooner than every, uh, than every nine years later. <clears throat> but let's just turn that around and change that a bit, because this was not really policy-relevant research. This is what we were doing. And as we started engaging more with policymakers, our research has benefited from this fundamental understanding, but is also tuned to more, uh, let's say, more immediately relevant things. And just to give you an example of the kind of thing we were finding out there, uh, this question was, how does ammonia interact with grassland uh, before the grass is cut? Uh, there's a little bit, top right, there's a little bit of emission from the bottom. things about ammonia dynamics. For example, if you want to put your fertilizer on, uh, get it under the vegetation, not onto the leaf surfaces. Uh, some people quite like foliar dressings of nitrogen onto the leaf surface. It can maximize your own Whatever the topic, we saw that in this morning's lecture from Andre, of deepening the fundamental understanding. If we don't understand it right, we're not going to give good advice. Um, but I would also say that we need to simplify. 
and develop the bigger picture. That simplification may be needed as a communication tool. If nobody understands your science, no one will act on your science. So how do we simplify? And that's a really interesting topic for argument, how, how simple is acceptable. <clears throat> I think we all have to pinpoint the barriers and, and look at addressing them. And I'll come to some of that as I go across, otherwise nothing is done. Um, and listening and addressing what people care about. They care about environment, health. As far as I can see, governments also really care about money. Business really cares about money. We can't ignore that. Um, and be ready to move fast when needed. Um, and that doesn't mean nine years. That means uh, what is, it can often mean, what is the advice you can give now, this afternoon, in the next 10 minutes? <coughs> and let's uh, really simplify this slide some more. Uh, simple numbers. A slideshow of images and um, a picture hopefully tells a thousand words. This is our Scottish equivalent. making a difference to biodiversity on the land. <coughs> and this is actually uh, one of our simplest uh, entry points into policy, um, was, well, what should you do to protect? And on this slide, I've shown, and I famously pressed the button I shouldn't press, but it's back. Um, <laughs> only press the left and right, Jakob. Um, <laughs> so the ones on the left, they love a clean air don't like ammonia and nitrogen pollution. The one on the right, the golden one, loves it. So too much nitrogen pollution, the golden one comes in. And in the two graphs is what happened on the twigs and what happened on the trunks. The blue line is the disappearance of those lichens with dirty air. And the red line is the increase. We were able to use this and other data sets to address a policy question, which was what is the level you need to protect ecosystems? And in the UNECE, which is the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, they have a transboundary convention on air pollution, and they had been using eight microgram per meter cubed. And so we organized a conference. We got all the scientists together. Uh, we built up that there was a consensus about this, and the net result was uh, we agreed that the critical level should be one. So this is a really nice, I say easy, point of policy engagement because it's affected an international standard. By the way, it doesn't mean that they've done anything about the air pollution, uh, but at least it means they now recognize that they've got a much bigger problem than they thought they had. Because if they thought eight was okay, but it's only one is okay, um, that's important. We had people come from our Environment Protection Agency coming to us and saying, you can't agree that number, because if you agree that number, our farms are going to be in big trouble. And we said, well, that's how it is, folks. It, you know, it, so it can't be helped that that is the number. It is what it is, and they will have to accommodate accordingly. So let's start with some flows, go with some impacts. The next part for us was scaling up. And here we're scaling up to the UK in the first instance. The left is a map of where all those ammonia air pollution emissions are. Most of the emissions are coming from agricultural sources. So the right 
map shows you what's the main source in any particular location. So the green mostly down the west of the country is cattle farming dominating, dark green, beef cattle, light green, uh, da uh, dairy cattle, uh, red is pigs and poultry. The crops are not the main source in the UK. So this is really useful for informing policy about where they need to take action, but it still doesn't get them there. And I, I spent a long time reporting into Geneva Our Science and watching the policymakers about what makes a difference, what makes them tick. And we supported them in something called the Gothenburg Protocol, where they agreed in May 20, uh, 20, 2012 a 70 percent reduction of sulfur dioxide and a 2 percent reduction of ammonia. So, so the really they've, they've not got there yet. Um, this is the kind of information we then move on to, which is measures on practical guidance. And I think a key thing here is that it's international guidance, so we're working, clubbing together with other countries across this UN region and, and coming up in this document like this with also what are the top measures. Um, the document will contain many, but I simplify it to the top five. And this actually was a list of if countries were to agree mandatory measures, what would their priorities be? Um, so we kept it really simple for them. And you see, the first thing is you're going to spread manure on the surface, get it into the soil, not on the soil. Improve your animal feeding. Uh, if you've got a manure store, put a lid on it. It's not rocket science in this instance. Uh, if you can smell your manure, you're losing the goodness because it's going into the air, into your nose rather than in the crop. Farm nitrogen balances are great, uh, but we only said demonstration farms for the start, and finally low emission pig and poultry. So this is short list. Ultimately, they decided not to do any of those. They decided not to revise an existing mandatory regime. So you could say, did we, did we have an impact on policy? I think we did, because what essentially the countries found out in the negotiations in Geneva was that they understand that you could do these measures and that the only reason they're not doing them is the political barriers. Essentially, the agriculture ministries in Europe were bigger than the environment ministries. And the agriculture ministries would have farmer organizations behind them saying, don't do anything, please leave us alone. So there was a fear. So we need to understand that fear um, and you know, deal with it. And well, first off, nobody likes being regulated. Nobody likes being told what you can and can't do. But they were often saying this was economically bad. And I want, as I go further forward, to say this is not economically bad. If you invest right, this is an economic opportunity. So here is my favorite measure. And I don't think you have so many livestock on the Maldives, but it's still my favorite measure. Um, and the measure is when you put manure on the surface of the ground, don't just fling it like this. This is a splash plate. Fling the manure up all over the surfaces. It's maximizing that contact with the atmosphere, so increasing the emissions to air. And these technologies have been around for years. Uh, the inject it into the soil is the most ambitious. If not, put it between the grass blades under the canopy, because remember, the canopy will recover some of the nitrogen, which we learned from our early science. Or the very simplest, just put it out in night yeast rows, because those rows reduce the area. So this is a, a really interesting set because the Netherlands made that bottom right one, that one, mandatory in about 1995. So we are 30 years in to a country having done that for all of their farmers. And in the UK, the discussion is, should we move from this to any of them? Now, of course, some farmers are moving voluntarily. What happened 2008, there was a price, the economical crisis some farmers started buying this kit voluntarily. So they invest in the kit. A farmer I know uh, invested in this kit, put a lid on his manure, and then found out he didn't need so much fertilizer. So he had to do the capital investment, but ultimately, on this is a big farm, 2,000 hectares, he was saving 70,000 pound a year because he doesn't need to buy so much fertilizer. Um, but I think it's a social thing, and this is where I think um, get, get our mind thinking. Nobody drives a car or a motorbike, if it's a pe petrol one, without an exhaust pipe. You know, you don't do it. You have an exhaust pipe. It does, ma does some management. It doesn't do everything, but it does some management. Here, we have the technologies, and we are not applying them. So somehow, what would be not acceptable in one domain is acceptable in another. And I think that's a social thing we have to keep 
are mobilizing that if we have the best technologies, let's use them. <coughs> now, let's make this a bit more complicated. Now, let's just skip several models here. Imagine that you've got a spatial model of Europe, all the emissions going up. And you imagine you put into your model all the mitigation measures and you for ammonia and for nitrogen oxides from combustion sources. And then you put in the prices of all of them. Ultimately, the first measures you take are the cheap ones. They can give you a benefit. But the further you go, the more expensive it will get, and ultimately it will cost. And that's what these two graphs show. Let's take it with ammonia first. So it says that the first, this is the emission reduction and how far you go. And this is saying initially when you do those measures, you're getting more benefit than the cost. And this is counting environmental costs as well, environmental benefits. So there's a big benefit of taking action, but ultimately if you do a lot, it'll get more expensive and it won't be worthwhile doing it anymore. Um, nitrogen oxides is much steeper and it is going down. So if we take this, uh, take a, a couple of red lines there, basically nitrous oxi nitrogen oxides, you can get to 300 reduction. Ammonia, you could get to 1,000 reduction. So essentially it's saying that this is cheaper and a cost-benefit ratio to do with this. And yet, all the policies are still doing more of this and ignoring that. And the reason for that is that this is transport and industry and it's more acceptable to control air pollution from transport industry. It's less politically acceptable to control ammonia. So I, I have to say I thought a graph like that was just the great graph of science for policymakers. It's just, just the, the kind of thing. thing. They, they talk about it in Geneva, very happy with a graph like that, and yet it didn't change their hearts and minds. It didn't make the agreement. So let's keep pushing. And at this point, I'm going to go beyond talking about ammonia to talk about the wider nitrogen cycle. Because ammonia is linked to the nitrogen cycle. There's lots of different forms. And when we think about all those nitrogen forms together, we get lots of win-win-win-wins sitting together. So, and we can simplify it. And this is my simplification here to make an acronym as well. The wages are too much nitrogen, or as my colleague says, nitrogen waging war on the environment. Water quality, air quality, greenhouse balance, ecosystems, biodiversity, and soil quality. We can add to that stratospheric ozone as well, uh, that nitrous oxide is now the main stratospheric ozone depleting substance. So there's really, if we manage nitrogen, we can get a hit on all of those and uh, be more economical. So that's the simple view. Uh, that's the view I think is quite good for policymakers. This is a bit more scientific. You can say whether it's too detailed or not too detailed. The point of this graph is to show how, in a reasonable level of detail, things interact. We've got high temperature combustion giving nitrogen oxides and nitrous oxide. We've got fertilizer manufacture and crop biological nitrogen fixation uh, going into the crops but leaking out of the system, those gases again, and the ammonia. Out of the bottom, we've got leaching into the rivers. That reacts in the atmosphere, ammonia and nitrogen oxides producing ammonium nitrate. It's in rain, but it's also the substance of fine particulate matter deep into the lungs. As the ecosystems get saturated, they themselves start releasing more nitrogen to the atmosphere until finally these nitrogen compounds are converted back to atmospheric nitrogen. This N2 is the low energy form. It's the nitrogen that's in the air. 78% of every breath we take is pure N2 nitrogen, unreactive. It's what these compounds will get back to. But by making fertilizers, by biological nitrogen fixation, by combustion, we make those reactive forms. Other thing to say is that in this process, 80% of that nitrogen resource is wasted. So it's a dumb thing for the economy. And those are a longer list of issues, uh, the same ones again, but a slightly longer list of those issues. So this cascade of nitrogen is pointing towards we need a joined up approach. And the, the hypothesis as a scientist is, will that joined up approach help us give a bigger perspective that helps mobilize action? There's an extra line on there, by the way, just coming up fresh. See at the top there. Um, and that is that as part of the energy transition uh, for decarbonization, people want a hydrogen economy. But managing hydrogen is tricky. It's very leaky. So there's a lot of conversation about making ammonia deliberately to burn it. Um, and in principle, that could see a tripling of ammonia supply in the next uh, 40 years, 30 years, 
um, with concomitant risks for new forms of pollution. So let's move on to our South Asian nitrogen hub. We've been developing these ideas along, and along comes this opportunity for funding uh, through the South Asian nitrogen hub. We're attempting to look at these issues of barriers and realize that we need to work together, not just science with policymakers, with government, but also with business, wider civil society, village scale engagement, and, and a whole range of interacting issues there that we need to address, capacity building, circular economy, local needs, etc. So I think this kind of wider philosophy, you see it's going wider and wider. We started with a few fluxes, and now we're into multi-dimensional social and natural sciences engagement. Of course, in the middle of this, we still do our quantitative modeling, since that provides the backbone of what we need to say where it is, how much is it. This being a picture of the ammonia emissions estimated across South Asia. And we discover that South Asia is actually a global hotspot for nitrogen pollution. It's a good grounds for why South Asia may also become political champions on this topic. <coughs> but also, from the big scale, also the small scale is important. The, the learning, the school activities, uh, the building of communities of scientists, the top right community of scientists doing their measurements in an agricultural situation, the bottom right, a new community of lichenologists working out how to identify plants and know what it means to look like. What does nitrogen damage look like? <coughs> in the village scale, developing shortlists, again, in context of what would be a good set of measures. Don't use too much fertilizer. You'd think it would be a dumb thing to use too much fertilizer because you waste money. But so many farmers do because it feels like a bit of insurance. Why not just add a bit more? particularly if fertilizers are subsidized. Uh, using all the organic resources available so you can reduce your fertilizer input. Uh, reducing residue burning. On th I was on Thodu at the weekend. There's a lot of residue burning goes on. Of course, they might say this is a really good for mobilizing other nutrients, like the potassium, the phosphorus. Uh, but the nitrogen will be going <laughs> straight up there. Also on the side of the key were all the bags of fertilizer at the Thodu key. And I was thinking, how many bags of fertilizer are going in? How much is going up into the atmosphere? How much is leaking down oh. into the reef? Um, collect and you cover your urine and, and avoid biomass burn, uh, burning of urea, of, of manures. <coughs> Coming on to that question of coral bleaching um, and the suffering of, of the reefs, we still have an open question to what extent nutrient pollution, both nitrogen and phosphorus, would be uh, making the reefs more vulnerable to, uh, to bleaching or slow recovery when it does. So when you've had a bleaching event, in principle, the reef may regrow, but is it gonna start getting algae on it and other things like that? And that's what we're investigating. <coughs> um, we're also looking at translating the work into multiple languages. We have what's called a MOOC, a massive online open course. So it's been uh, put into many different languages uh, with that, uh, QR code, one can access that system and get a basic level of training which is suitable for peoples in schools, universities, etc., to get a much wider understanding of nitrogen issues. Of course, in the end, it's coming towards how do we steal this for uh, policy processes. There's a few photographs there, various workshops, and I've got my date wrong, it was November. Uh, November uh, 2022, we were here in this room um, and uh, and Dr. Sharif was uh, able to present the South Asia Nitrogen Policy Report to the Vice President. And, uh, you know, that goes forward. That's a policy report on policies, but it's not yet the policy. So that must be the next stage, how to get towards a national action plan for the Maldives that brings these things together. And one of the things we're doing in working with the South Asia Cooperative Environment Program is a framework, uh, South Asia, action plan, framework, uh, roadmap for nitrogen in South Asia, under which different national policies could be informed by and developed. That's, there's going to be a workshop 31st of August and uh, to discuss that. So let's uh, think about different narratives. And this is very much a pathway. Uh, it's a pathway about barriers and how to overcome them. And we're not at the end of the path yet. I would say for me, this was a narrative that started with, let's reduce pollution and the pollution of individual forms. That means different scientists are working on different pollutants, not talking to each other very well. 
We've started getting them talking better, but we were missing the synergies between pollutants and we're seeing a critical mass. And some would say that a focus on reduced pollution is a bit negative. Why are you always complaining? It's so dirty. Uh, uh, can't you be positive, they say. Well, then we moved on from that, and there was a focus on let's be positive. Let's increase nitrogen efficiency, because who can object to increasing efficiency? Um, so it's a positive one. We, we did explore some international goals on that. Uh, there were some challenges with getting some uh, equitability on that of how, how to have a shared goal while differentiating different situations. And I think that was perhaps a major barrier. We haven't gone away from this. We're still framing for increased, uh, increased efficiency. But I think we're going beyond it as well. And that going beyond is the reduce of wasted resources. Uh, a few years ago, people have talked about uh, to address nitrogen, you should use less fertilizer. And the moment I see that, I see big barriers coming up, particularly from fertilizer industry, and say, you can't reduce fertilizer. We need it for our food. Don't do it. You're foolish. Well, so it's an easy trap to fall into. But who can object to reducing waste? Nobody can object to reducing waste, I think. Feel free to object, by the way. Um, so essentially, it's summing all of those, those nitrogen losses, including denitrification to N2. So ammonia is a form of pollution. But if you convert the ammonia or the nitrate to N2, it's not pollution, but it is a waste of resources. And so we're looking at all of those and adding up, and it's actually allowing a shared goal. So we're having this conversation about halving nitrogen waste. Um, if you have nothing to halve, if you have no waste, you have nothing to halve. So it's proportionate to what you have. And, and that then takes us to this question of how to simplify, uh, how to communicate. So this, just, this is a scientist training to work with a marketing agency as an amateur. Uh, and this is our attempt to simplify, simplify. So half means bold action, more or less feasible with all the measures. Nitrogen, well, it's obvious we're talking about nitrogen. Uh, waste, that it's a waste of money is bad for the environment. That everybody could agree that waste is a dumb thing. Um, 2030 is sustainable development goal alignment. In fact, we originally wanted to do it 2050, but for various international lobbying, uh, led to 2030. So how are we getting on with that, with that halving nitrogen waste campaign? Uh, the idea came up in January 2018, and we launched it in October 2018 at that o Ocean Conference. They gave me one minute to speak. And when you only get one minute to speak, you need to make it memorable. So um, I'm sorry not on this occasion, but on that occasion, you get me wearing a Scottish kilt so that somebody will notice and take note of our one minute. Um, we've got it adopted in the Colombo Declaration, which was an agreement by, um, by 14 countries. I need to check if Maldives is on the list. I think they are. Um, and it's informed the farm to fork strategy of the European Union. It's been embraced in part uh, by the second of two resolutions we've worked on, accelerating action to reduce nitrogen waste. So the term nitrogen waste now exists in a UN resolution. Um, and it's been taken up by the COP15 Global Biodiversity Framework, Target 7, has reducing pollution uh, by at least half. So it's helped those things on the way. Um, that doesn't mean that we have the practice there yet. But I think if we have a mobilization of the ideas, it's a step forward. I want to just give you an indication a bit about how we went to the first resolution. So we came here to Maldives, September 2017, working with the South Asia Corporate Environment Program, a group of about 25 scientists and policymakers sitting together. Out of that document came a first uh, one and a half pages first resolution, quickly written while somebody else was presenting, but then shared on the screen and working on it together, improving it so it became the group document, one and a half pages, as a draft resolution for the United Nations. We were too late to go to the next assembly, but we went to the next governing council of SACEP, and that was agreed that by the ministers of the governing council. Yes, they want this resolution. They're ready to take it to UNEP. And that's where we need a lead country, and in this case, India agreed to be the lead country taking it through to the Committee of Permanent Representatives doing the negotiation. Um, I'll say the outcome is the Nitrogen Working Group, which is existing, 
is not yet this thing, INCOM, which is Interconventional Nitrogen Coordination Mechanism, that's not yet there. But you can see how the stepwise process goes, and it takes about five years or so. There is the second resolution, uh, led by Sri Lanka, the first one by India, the second one by Sri Lanka, in partnership with support from the uh, South Asia Nitrogen Hub, funded by the UKRI. And um, you get a page and a half of things to agree. And, and there's, I've just put it in, in bold, a couple of the key lines. So it's quite soft language. It's not legally binding, but it is recognizing that this is an issue to be addressed. Um, they wouldn't agree half. Some countries objected to the half, but nevertheless, they knew we were talking about half, and half came in six months later in the Global Biodiversity Framework. So it came back again. And this, this line here, this is worth really just an illustration of gaming, of science policy working together. So we knew as scientists you need national action plan to mobilize action. And I think some of the countries knew that too. But other countries blocked it. And they said, no, we're not going to have it. We're not going to have it. So uh, I was working with Sri Lanka and we basically agreed, how can you make the weakest possible statement so weak that they'll accept it, the countries which are blocking? And here is our weakest possible statement. It encourages to share information as available uh, according to national circumstances. This is so amazingly weak, the blocking country agreed. But in this chess game, what the blocking country didn't realize, or perhaps they did, didn't mind, They've just enshrined in a UN resolution that there is such a thing as national action plans on sustainable nitrogen management. And we've now been using that to mobilize, say, there are the national action plans. Let's all push them forwards. So a bit of gaming. Now on to history. Nitrogen is often subsidized and is made too cheap. And it used to be a really amazingly valuable resource. I go back a thousand years, uh, you could by human life for about six to eight kilograms of nitrogen. It was a really precious commodity. Through upscaling in the Industrial Revolution, it got cheaper and cheaper. We've made it even cheaper in this period of unsustainably cheap nitrogen. And we've seen, this is 2022 there, where it went shooting back up again. Is this early signs of a high price nitrogen future? If ammonia starts being used as an energy carrier, that triples global nitrogen flows, uh, then that may see prices going up further to more align with energy markets. More work is needed on that. If so, that could make people more well motivated to take action. And here's a few, I said, simple numbers. This is a scientist, so I will defend these numbers as being more or less right. Uh, so take the UK. We waste through air, land, and water, about three and a half billion pounds worth of nitrogen. We spend on our total agricultural subsidy for all things in agriculture about three billion. So we're spending more than the, we're wasting more than the total value of our subsidy. In the EU, they have a thing called common agricultural policy. They spend about 55 billion euro per year. They waste about 60 billion euros worth of nitrogen. And in the world, rough numbers. So this is a huge resource, and I would say for people in policy making that they're, they're doing these subsidies, do they spend 110% of their time talking about nitrogen? No, they spend about 0.1% of their time talking about nitrogen. This is a real argument for more mobilization. So we're pushing them towards uh, action by getting people aware of these issues. Uh, we're not saying exactly how far you should go, but that's their decision, but trying to catalyze change giving them guidance. This is another UNEC guidance document where now we're integrating across the nitrogen cycle. Lots of different measures there on the right, and they're good for ammonia or bad for NOx, etc. cetera. Um, and then ultimately, distilling out where are the places you can take action. You can take action in agriculture, crop or livestock. You can take action in transport and industry. There's opportunities for nitrogen oxides recapture. The wastewater system. Imagine that a wastewater system is not destroying nitrogen, which it currently looks to do to clean the water, but recover the nitrogen to become a fertilizer production plant. And our consumption patterns make a difference as well, how much uh, meat and dairy we eat. Uh, finally, spatial optimization. So those are the range of things we need to do across society. And at the end of this, I ask myself, all this complexity, how could I distill this into something very simple? 
This is my attempt. Whether it's simple enough for you, I don't know. Uh, but let me talk you through it. And um, it's an attempt at simplification. So what does the circular economy mean for nitrogen? It means that we have less inputs and it's utilized because we keep utilizing and reutilizing. So manure back again into here, uh, uh, wastewater is recovered and turned back into fertilizer. So this is what we call white nitrogen being recovered. There's a conversation about brown ammonia, which is made with fossil fuels. That's still there. The conversation about blue ammonia, which is made with carbon capture storage. Uh, but there's this conversation about green ammonia as well, which says it's made with renewable energy. And once you start making it with renewable energy, you can also make it deliberately to burn it as an alternative fuel stock. So that's this cycle here, utilized as energy. So that doesn't exist yet. This is where we are at the moment. But in 40 years' time, we could be having both these dimensions, dimensions of the circular economy, uh, where nitrogen is becoming even more critical. I think this is the last graph. And it's, in a way, realistic and a way unrealistic. It's realistic because it tells you this is a rough number of the total amount of nitrogen that's wasted according to uh, 2020 prices um, over time. And the amount that's wasted has simply gone up and up and up. We're wasting more. This is the sum of all the emissions to air, to water, etc. And you can see all those different international agreements that have or haven't made a difference. Maybe it would be worse if they hadn't have been there. The red line here is what would happen if in the future people started eating even more meat and dairy. Uh, that, will, that will get up. So that our ambitions for our food consumption make a difference. It's unrealistic because how, how, how really are we going to get to halve that by 2030? Uh, it looks Compared with what everything went before, surely that is impossible. There's, th there's a conversation about getting to 2050. But I think we still have to have this conversation to say, if we don't start now, if we don't mobilize and don't say, uh, these are all the problems and all the solutions. So essentially, why work on nitrogen? Nitrogen is hidden across all the environmental issues. It's in climate change, in air pollution, water pollution, uh, biodiversity loss. If we manage nitrogen better, we can save a really valuable resource, contributing to the economy, all those issues at the same time. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the audience? I think Mark has given an excellent presentation regarding nitrogen. Um, we have a question here. study in Maldives as well, so it is great. But I'm, my question is, we have curiosity recently raised about the death of coconut trees, the most commonly grown uh, food crop in Maldives, and also plantation of um, taro and maniac dye. And plantation of? Taro, it's one of the crops that we use for okay. as a stable food. Um, and we have imported from Kenya some um, what do you call some um, seeds of this to give up, to um, help regrowth of taro plants. And I'm just curious to know whether there's any correlation with this situation, emission of nitrogen excess is causing this um, uh, situation in Maldives. Uh, on the, the um, who wants to be a millionaire, there's always the question where you can phone a friend, go 50-50, um, because I don't know the answer, oh. but Rifath is going to give you a really great answer to this question. <laughs> I know, Mark. Uh, yeah, taro is like a yam, uh, a little bit uh, kind of a tuber crop grown in the swampy areas in, 
it's mostly found in the swampy areas, but in Ryland, in the Caribbean, in the Pacific Islands, also they used to have as a food crop. And uh, I think the death of the taro, sorry, I have to answer this. The death of the taro in Maldives is mostly related to a blight, actually, which uh, is uh, because taro is mostly cloned, vegetative uh, tuber, like it is cloned kind of a plant. So what happens is when one disease causes, it kind of wipes out the whole thing. So it happened in around the 90s. We imported a few crop, and then that's what. So I, for the next question. Oh, the next one, the coconut. Can you do yes. the coconut as well? <laughs> No. <laughs> no, yeah, coconut, I don't know much about, but taro, because we are doing a research, that's how okay. I came to know about yeah. I think Paul has a question. I do. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. That was very interesting. Um, one query I have is, um, how is this scientific message <coughs> of halving nitrogen use um, or the effects of nitrogen um, being conveyed to farmers in rural areas in developing countries. Is there a, an uncomplicated link in the messaging mm -hmm. that will get them to take up this yeah, uh, yeah. desire? So one of the challenges, I think, of a hub like ours is that, you know, changing the world, the whole of it, is a hard thing to do. And we have, on the one hand, engagement with farmers in, let's say, 12 villages across South Asia. We have a, a social engagement a bit wider than that. Uh, and obviously, have the conversations with the, the governments and the intergovernmental. Uh, the, the latter one gives you scale, but you're not directly talking to the farmer. And the first one, you can talk to 12 villages. Um, the, one of the slides I showed was about the, the things you can do in your village. Like, everybody should cover their manure pile, yeah. everybody. If you, anybody smells manure, this is a dumb thing to do. This is really obvious things you should do, and some are already doing it. I think the, with the fertilizer use, I think the, the most wonderful example is the urea deplacement, where farmers are using urea, but putting them into the soil, and they can show that you can get the same yield with 60 or 70% of the fertilizer. So instantly you can save the money. So I think on a village scale, uh, people can see the case. The question comes with, uh, if they are not doing it, how do you go further? So, for example, many farmers in Bangladesh are not doing that because the, the fertilizer is too cheap. Um, so then you, then you get into the conversation of how could the policies help nudge it along the way. And that was something I was mentioning earlier to you, but to, for the others, you could imagine a world where you have a different, you're gonna have a fertilizer subsidy, okay, but give a better fertilizer subsidy for the more environmentally friendly approach and, and not just a flat playing field. So there's, there's nudging. Um, there will be cases, I think the, the European situation, the farmers will be told not to do something or they must use low emission manure spreading. And then they say, we don't want to do that or we can't afford the equipment. So then I think the next part of the policies is giving capital grants and things to help farmers uh, buy kit and move, move forward. Uh, one more, which I think is a job for the economists, is much more information on economic planning that can give farmers the confidence to know that they can invest in something and ultimately will have a payback period. We need a lot more of that. Any other? Uh, I think we can carry this conversation later. Uh, so yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, because we have a huge goal, I think, by 2030. From Green Revolution, we have been producing, I mean, with the, for the yield increase, we are using more of nitrogen. So how do you think uh, in the future, what would it look like in the food industry, in the agriculture industry? In the food industry? Yes. Yeah. I think. Let's not forget po human population, and let's not forget our consumption choices. Um, so, you know, I think we forget human population too often because the human population is still growing in many parts of the world. South Asia is projected to increase. So FAO will give you the position of, we just will need more fertilizer because there'll be more people. Uh, perhaps I find that a bit limiting because it's also a question of what are going to be our appetites for consumption. So uh, there's a rapid increase in chicken eating at, at, at across the world. The number of chicken going now is much, much more now. And so long food chains have more losses. 
uh, the nitrogen losses are much bigger. Um, so our approach to that has been not to has been to analyze the European situation. We in Europe eat twice the amount of meat and dairy than is needed for a healthy diet. We're not, I'm not saying we should be vegetarian necessarily on these grounds, but on environmental grounds is about how much, not yes or no. Um, so that's why we have a conversation about a demetarian diet, about halving your meat and dairy intake. But that's something that we see that the countries are starting to talk about in air pollution negotiations, but a very, very long way away from imagining what policy would you do to nudge your citizens as to their food choices. Then, of course, you've got the question that still the poorest still need better diets, of course. So it's going to be a mix, but I think the poorest are aspiring to the richest. And what the rich do, of course, makes a difference uh, as well. So that will be for us. About how much do we travel by car or by plane or by boat? How much do we eat meat and dairy? I think we have to hold the societal consumption issues just as important as the technical measures. Uh, and one other thing about the 50, why, why the 50? 50 is about the point you can sort of nearly get to with technical measures. Uh, you won't get beyond 50 with technical measures, and some would say you can't quite get there. So you're in the realms of saying, if we want ambitious, we have to do, uh, manage our consumption and our technical measures. Thank you. That was a very wonderful session. Um, I think that's the end of the session. Uh, I would like to invite our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Mohammed Sharif, to give away a token of appreciation to Professor Mark Sutton. Thank you, Mark. This takes to the end of today's keynote sessions. The parallel sessions will now begin on second and third floor of E Block, FSGS building at 2.30 p.m. Wish you a productive evening. Thank you all. And uh, there will be a gala dinner tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, at, at MNU FEPE Hall. <laughs>